Hey guys. Uh, I'm Michael. And I'm Anna. And we're going to be discussing our research for the 2017 CIF topic. Uh, and our presentation is titled Change Through Bilateral Treaties An Actor Based Approach to Non Proliferation and CCBT Ratification. So we're going to start with a quick overview. Uh, so, with an increasing number of countries invested in nuclear weapons research and training, the global nuclear threat has skyrocketed over the past few decades. The development of more uh, powerful and efficient weapons, combined with growing international tensions, has resulted in the strategic positioning of nuclear weapons worldwide. The corresponding deadlocks and stasis between nations has resulted in increasing global nuclear vulnerability. By the numbers, Russia possesses over 7,000 nuclear warheads, and the U.S. comes in at a close second, approximately 6,800 warheads. China retains over 260 enabled weapons and has numerous other weapons that are currently in a disabled state. And there are numerous other nuclear players, including India, Ch uh, Pakistan, Israel, France, and the UK, all of which have significant nuclear capabilities. All right, so I'm going to talk about some areas of friction. So a lot of these you've heard before today already. There is the issue of India and Pakistan, a long-standing conflict that has existed since about the 1940s. Both of these countries have not signed or ratified the CTPT, and basically they're waiting for the other one to do so, and they both have legitimate security concerns in, in a conventional military standpoint that is translated to a nuclear framework. So China, the US, and Russia are a little bit different in terms of their relationship to the CTPT, because China and the US both haven't ratified, but Russia actually has. But all three of these countries are big players for global and regional hegemony. And so a lot of these countries are just playing in order to get the most global influence, and that's an area of friction in terms of non-proliferation generally, and also in terms of CTBT ratification. And in the Middle East, we've definitely heard a lot about this, whether it's about Egypt, Israel, or Iran. And the issue here is both state and non-state actors. That includes some like Saudi Arabia that you haven't heard of, and some like Iran that are in the news practically every day. And all these countries have conventional military concerns that, again, translate to the nuclear framework, and many of them have yet to ratify the CTPT. North Korea is the last one, which, uh, again, I'm sure we all know about, and it has yet to sign or ratify the CTPT, and is unlikely to do so in the near future. Uh, so, let's now talk about the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, the, comp the CTPT, or the Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, is a legally binding global ban on nuclear explosive uh, to testing. In particular, created and approved for, uh, open for signing in 1996, the treaty involves critical provisions designed to ensure a universal moratorium on nuclear weapons development. We've outlined two of the primary articles in this slide. In particular, Article 1.1 aims to restrict the verdict of proliferation of techno nuclear technology in NPT-recognized weapon states. Now, what verdict of proliferation means is essentially that countries, the countries that currently have nuclear weapons are expanding their arsenals. So examples that immediately come to mind are the US and Russia. Article 1.2 strives to contain the horizontal proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, now this means that countries that currently have nuclear technology are providing that technology to areas that do not currently have the ability to develop nuclear weapons. Article 1.2 also sets restrictions on nuclear explosive testing. And that's primarily the uh, focus of the CTBT. This treaty therefore instills a multifold deterrent on weapons testing. If a country decides to develop nuclear weapons, it will have A, no support from the international community, but B, will also develop weapons at the risk of substantial failure. So, the current status of the CTBT is it was adopted by the UN General Assembly in September of 1996. 71 states have signed and ratified the treaty. Those are states like European states and Russia. Those are some pretty prime examples. Also includes Latin American states, African states, and Southern Pacific states. 17 states have signed but not ratified the treaty, for example, China, the US, and Iran. And out of those eight states defined in Annex 2 have not ratified the treaty, which prevents its implementation. And that includes the US, China, Iran, Israel, Egypt, but also includes countries that have neither signed nor ratified, like Pakistan, India, and North Korea. And so this is a graph that you've heard about earlier today, and you've probably seen a couple of times. It basically just shows the relative success of nuclear treaties. So when the Partial Test Ban Treaty was enacted, tests shifted from atmospheric to underground explosions, and even though the CTBT hasn't come into effect yet, you can see that after it, after it was opened for signatures, the amount of underground nuclear explosions decreased significantly to the point where they're basically non-existent except for the North Korea. 
So, to talk about some commitment of individual actors, some main concerns of CTBT ratification and general non-proliferation, the first is the United States, probably the most egregious offender because the Senate failed to ratify the treaty. Uh, it failed 48 to 51 in 1999, and it was labeled as dangerous to U.S. national security interests. But, despite that, the United States continues to abide by all provisions of the CTBT, meaning they do not conduct any underground nuclear explosions besides the subcritical but that means that the United States, although it hasn't ratified the treaty, is basically abiding by it. Iran, on the other hand, as well as other middle, many Middle Eastern states, see nuclear proliferation as a manifestation to protect their national security. And while Iran and many other countries maintain that their nuclear program is purely peaceful, and, and that has been somewhat validated in the recent Iran Accords, they all pursue object objectives trying to benefit their national security. And that means that it's a back and forth. Uh, so we can also talk about India and North Korea. In particular, uh, you've also heard about this previously. India's decision not to sign the CCBT is primarily a combination of its stance on nuclear uh, nuclear uh, disarmament as well as its national security concerns. Another uh, reason that India has not yet signed the CCBT is the discriminatory argument which we've heard about uh, from previous presentations that the treaty favors countries that have already tested and verified that their weapons work. Countries like India that have not yet, yet had sufficient time to test their weapons are in this limbo state where they are not sure whether their weapons work and then are asked to abide by the treaty, which is uh, a significant problem for India. And then Pakistan engaged in a bilateral conflict with India uh, and refuses to sign until India does. India is a firm no. Pakistan is also a no as well. And North Korea will not sign any sort of international treaty, the CCPT in particular, until as long as the U.S. maintains its aggressive stance. And this stance has not been defined or elaborated on at all, and there's no really real indication of when North Korea uh, in its irrational actor state will really determine whether the U.S. is in a non-aggressive or aggressive stance. So we really have no idea for how long North Korea plans to hold out on the CTBT, but given that North Korea is currently uh, in some sort of this sort of a state, there is no indication that the CTBT will be uh, put into effect anytime soon. So given these four case studies, we've come to one primary conclusion, which is that the CTBT's unilateral method, although it is an excellent first step, fails to address regional motivations that are critical to, uh, to uh, discuss between bilateral countries as well as uh, other types of regional uh, discord. So we have therefore proposed a policy that provides an integration of numerous different regional components as well as a global concern. All right, so at this point we've heard a lot of problems with the CTBT and a lot of problems in general regarding non-proliferation. And now let's go on to what the solution is in our proposed policy. So it hinges on a framework that relies on a generally multilateral treaty, in this case that's the CTBT, that has a uniform global principle for states. That means don't proliferate, don't conduct nuclear tests. We can hold everybody to the same standard. But on top of that, we need geopolitical regional based accords. That means that we need to negate in negotiate with countries, specifically the reasons why they have nuclear weapons and the reasons why they continue to proliferate. And that will address individual reasons for proliferation instead of just forcing them all into the same boat. Multilateral like, treaties like the CTBT are a really good first step, but they should be used as a launching block to, to create ratification and to further non-proliferation in general. And so this brings us to the first area where our policy proposal will be implemented, and that's the Middle East. And the roots of the conflict in the Middle East kind of go back to the Sunni Shia conflict. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know what that is, so I'm going to explain a little bit. It's basically a disagreement between two different sects of Islam, and it's manifested into a geopolitical dispute as well. On the Shia side is Iran, and on the Sunni side is mostly Saudi Arabia and Turkey. This conflict has manifested itself conventionally in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, but it drives a greater animosity between Iran and Saudi Arabia that leads both to proliferation. By engaging both Iran and Saudi Arabia together, by creating some, some form of bilateral accords and accounting for the Sunni Shia tensions, which caused both countries and created an incentive to proliferate, it would be much more effective. On top of that, Israel is another example which is where it is motivated by conventional concerns. Ever since the 1940s, Israel has the sense that its borders are under attack. And whether that's justified is up to you to decide, but regardless, that's their motivation in order to proliferate. And that means that if we want Israel to get rid of nuclear weapons, we need to ensure to them that their security is not under attack. Our proposal includes expanding ballistic missile defense systems like the Iron Dome to make
make sure that their voters aren't vulnerable, and increase security guarantees in general. And in general, and throughout the Middle East, specifically to relate to the Sunni Shia conflict, we propose using the Gulf Cooperation Council. Countries like the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait that have Iranian cultural ties, but Saudi Arabian religious ties, and as a result can be used to bridge, to bridge the gap and pledge support for not only CTBT ratification, but also a Middle Eastern nuclear free zone. In addition, another problem that I really couldn't leave out is the lack of governmental authority in areas like Syria and Libya. We need, there needs to be a method that exists to address these stateless regions because nuclear reactors do exist and some entities make it controlled. We need a combination of, again, global and local frameworks engaging states that live that like exist there in addition to organizations like the UN in order to truly create like a safe environment that doesn't include proliferation by non-state actors like ISIS. And Southern Asia is another region where this framework can be applied, and that's the India-Pakistan conflict, which has existed also since the 1940s. These two countries have gone back and forth and had over three wars over territorial disputes in Kashmir and over disputes of hegemony in Bangladesh and in Afghanistan. But the point being that this dispute isn't going to go away anytime soon in a conventional sense. But the point, but both India and Pakistan are pretty military driven, but India is less so. So it can, India, in most cases, would be more likely to take the first step than Pakistan. In this, we propose using a framework like one used for the Nambu Basgo uh, hydroelectric reactor, which was a successful bilateral accord which created water security between both India and Pakistan. If we're able to engage both countries and ensure that both of them come to the table and negotiate regionally, then we can overlay that on top of the CTBT and prevent non and prevent proliferation. Our third scenario uh, rests with China, and China is currently uh, a signatory but not a ratification uh, nation that has not ratified the CTBT, and is currently reassembling its arsenal and conducting subcritical experiments. This is the subcritical loophole that was discussed in previous presentations. Now, in 2016, the Chinese military upgraded its ICBMs, or intercontinental ballistic missiles, from intermediate range to medium range weapons, and is later expected to upgrade its MIRVs in the near future. Now, all of these uh, modernization attempts give cause for concern, and the reason for these attempts lies in China's geopolitical rivalry with the United States. In particular, Chinese officials, and perhaps rightfully so, fear falling behind the rapid US and Russia modernization attempts. If they also abide and ratify the CTBT, will there any precautions? Their upgrading of ICBMs and MIRVs is a testament to the fact that they too feel the need to uh, keep modernization attempts um, in line with US and Russia policies. The only way that we can ensure that China too can ratify the CTBT lies in a bilateral solution between the US and China that is key to catalyze resolutions of current tensions. With the US um, implementing a 30 or $1 trillion modernization program, and China too upgrading its nuclear weapons, we cannot safely say that China has no justification for improving its nuclear weapons until we ensure that there is no justification uh, in terms of geopolitical rivalries and mistrust between both nations. So again, our principle relies on a solution that requires both nations to cooperate. And finally, uh, Russia. Although Russia has ratified the CTBT, as did US-Russia uh, modernization attempts, uh, are a major concern for non-proliferation. Part of Russia-U.S. nuclear arms race, uh, uh, modernization races, stems from their competitive arsenals, both of which are comparable in quality and quantity. One strategy that has worked in the past for Russia is an HEU to LEU de enrichment program that is known for, as megatons to megawatts. This program ran from 1992 to 2014, in which Russia sent warheads to the United States for de enrichment from HEU to LEU in the United States. Now this proposal will only solve part of the problems, uh, or similar proposals to this one, will only solve part of the problems between um, Russia and the US. Obviously there are now political concerns as well. And on top of that, both countries need to cooperate and engage in a bilateral solution because neither is 100% at fault. And we need to engage both in a solution that can uh, properly uh, revitalize bilateral agreements between the two. The HU to LU program might disincentivize further modernization which is a great first step in the near term, but future attempts must be done to catalyze a bilateral solution between both nations. And last but not least is North Korea. Being an irrational actor requires that we deal with North Korea in a much different perspective uh, that does not assume good faith or negotiations. 
Uh, recently, Donald Trump issued a proclamation that the United States would be willing to take unilateral action on North Korean nuclear policies, whether or not uh, it, uh, whether or not China agrees to cooperate with the U.S., which is a really hard line stance, but also stems from the fact that it is difficult, if not impossible, to engage North Korea in resolutions with, uh, with a treaty that is meant for rational actors. The CTBQ was developed and designed for solutions and incent to incentivize rational countries, but with North Korea in the mix and an unpredictable dictator, um, the only way to resolve some sort of tensions between North Korea and the rest of the world either lies in leading negotiations or taking a hardline stance. Alright, so to sum up, we basically have an approach that looks at the CTBT as a building block for the future. That means that we can use the treaty that already exists and look at the countries that haven't ratified and haven't signed it, as well as countries that have, to identify greater concerns for non-proliferation and to ensure a nuclear free future in general. Now, that means that whether we're looking at the Middle East or India and Pakistan or China or Russia, this sort of approach is flexible enough that it allows the engagement of all actors and really combats the problem at the source. So, at the end, I'd like to just thank our school team for all their work they put in, Dr. Eric Nelson for supervising this presentation, and all of you guys for listening. And I'd encourage you to pick up our paper outside. It has a more detailed version of this entire presentation. And I'd invite you all to ask any sort of questions because I acknowledge this was dense, or any sort of concerns you might have with this policy. Thank you very much. So uh, you mentioned that uh, a way to solve uh, regional conflicts in the Middle East um, was to get uh, large countries uh, and big players in the region, such as Saudi Arabia and Iran, to do bilateral reports. So how would you get uh, um, Saudis and Iranians to uh, agree to do anything together, especially when the government's to cater to uh, very radical, uh, very radical? So this is an understandable concern, and it's one that we addressed a little bit in our presentation. Uh, we mentioned that there are countries like the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, those that exist in the Persian Gulf region which are culturally more Iranian, but that religiously are Sunni and thus share Saudi Arabian motivations. A lot of these countries have expressed their support for a Middle East nuclear free zone and for ratification of the CTBT. These countries, because they have good relations with both Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, we hope can help bring them to the table and can incentivize some form of effective bilateral. Thank you. So, the, like, we, I know we didn't address this that much, but the U.S.'s reason for proliferation, I mean, in my opinion at least, is pretty irrational. But it, it makes some degree of sense, and it's that it competes for hegemony with both countries like China and Russia. And so, in perspective of some in the military and political establishment in the United States, nuclear weapons are critical in order to create some sort of equality between the countries. That's why we advocated joint U.S.-China and joint U.S.-Russia. These go in both ways, at least the way we present them. They all they encourage China and Russia to not proliferate, but just as much they encourage the United States to diminish their arsenal, ratify the CTBT, and engage in good faith good negotiations for non proliferation. Right, so we didn't exactly mention what the United States ought to do, but in its bilateral treaties, like Michael mentioned, between uh, Russia and China, each has different motivations for proliferation, and so we have different solutions for each, but our uh, common uh, theme for both the solutions is decreasing nuclear arsenals, and stopping further modernization attacks. For example, this recent program, $1 trillion over 30 years, that is catalyzing China's modernization as well, and the ongoing
ongoing modernization races between Russia, China, and the U.S., that needs to be stopped before any further discussions can be attempted regarding calling our current nuclear arsenal. You're certainly right that uh, their education is a crucial part for advancing uh, future generations' uh, mindset for nuclear disarmament. And currently, educational policies in India may not be the uh, education policies and status quo might not be the most adaptive for doing this. So, what I would recommend is while we do have these conferences and this is a wonderful international conference that spans uh, uh, both uh, Japan, Russia and the U.S., I think that we should further our education spectrum and include other countries as well. In particular, we should also we should tell our stories when we get back home, but we should also try to spread the word to other countries and hopefully instill some sort of these types of thoughts in other types of education systems as well, because we, this is an excellent start, but again, we need to keep improving and uh, instilling these types of ideas into other education systems as well. Yeah, and to go off that, change really comes from bottom up. That means that when we educate people about the harms that we've learned about here, but also about just in general, humanistic, political, economic, etc., all these impacts, it really goes a long way to incentivizing governments, no matter what form they may be, in order to take actions on nonproliferation. We didn't address that though, because our proposal hinges more in the short term. Education is undoubtedly important, I, without a doubt. But on top of that, we need to have a solution that will be viable in the next 10 years or so. One that really addresses the root of the problem and the status quo. And then hopefully in the future, these sort of sentiments that drive proliferation will not resurge due to the level of education and the peaceful education that we're going to provide. Thank you. Yeah, so in the U.S., it, the Senate has to ratify the treaty, not the president, but I can, I, I think I can speak safely for both of us, and I'll let one answer when I'm done, but I definitely think that if I were in a position of power, I would do everything possible in order to diminish proliferation in the United States, whether it involves supporting nuclear programs in other countries for non-peaceful purposes, or whether it involves, like, modernization programs at home that only in place. I also think that by the time we are of the age to assume the presidency, if that's possible, uh, hopefully with these education programs, we'll have a lot more public sentiment in uh, in the light of non-proliferation. So I think it will also be uh, much more pub with increasing public engagement. I think it will also be a universal uh, ideal to reduce proliferation, to reduce nuclear weapons. So I think it will certainly be a high priority uh, with ongoing education attempts.
Thank you all again.